Thanks for joining our Holy Spirit series. We trust that you'd be endued with power from on high. Be sure to order your copy of the series handbook entitled You Shall Receive Power at info at cohcc.net. This series forms part of the Christian Growth Track, which equips believers to find and fulfill their life purpose. If you enjoyed it, you'd most probably also find our Relentless Retreat or other modules of the Christian Growth Track most beneficial. Let's continue to discover the most powerful and important person on earth, the Holy Spirit. Are you ready for 10 dimensions of God's power? God so wants us to live empowered lives that he said I'm gonna give you ten dimensions of my power and these ten dimensions comes from ten either Greek or Hebrew words used in Scripture to refer to the authority or the power of God and why are words so important you see in in in, in the Hebrew language the names of God reveal to us who God is the, 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 the name he is Jehovah Jireh reveals that God is my provider doesn't make sense. The, the name Jehovah Rapha means he's my healer. The name Jehovah Shalom means he's my peace. And so even the name Christ, Jesus Christ, Christ means the anointed one. Every name of God reveals a dimension of God's character of who he is. And so these 10 names or 10 words referring to the power or the authority of God are like keys that unlock dimensions to God's power. And so we want to just jump straight into them because 10 is obviously a lot and we want to cover all of them tonight. So in Acts 1 verse 8, Jesus says, you shall receive power. But the word he uses in the Greek is dunamis. You will receive dunamis power. So the first dimension of power is dynamic power. And that's what we've spent on most this week. That we've spent most of our time looking at the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit. The word dunamis means dynamic. It means dynamite. It means dynamo. It's like the dynamo that we used to have on that, on those Breville Fitzer on, on, on our bicycles that had a little light and the dynamo and as you cycle you generate electricity and shine light. Your tongue, your, your heavenly prayer language is like a dynamo on the inside of you and the easiest way to tap into the dynamic dynamis power of the Holy Spirit is when you and I begin to pray in the Spirit. When we pray in the Spirit it's like cycling. If, if initially when you start cycling those thick wheel bikes it was like heavy. You struggle to get going and then you build up some momentum and you catch a little bit of a downhill and then you go fast and then you click your dynamo onto the wheel and suddenly you've got light. You see, so your, your prayer language, initially, when you, when you don't pray often, it's going to be a bit strenuous, it's going to be difficult, it's going to feel a bit awkward. But the more we do it, the more mo momentum we build in praying in the Spirit, we activate the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit in us. It's, it's like dynamite. And, I, and I've often seen that the, this, this dynamic power of the Holy Spirit in me can blast through when I need a breakthrough, when I feel a little bit depressed and I feel depressed and I feel discouraged, you know, when I start praying in the Spirit, I start praying in the Spirit, I, I ignite like the dynamite stick and at some point there's just this explosion and it bl blasts away whatever is hindering breakthrough. And so that's the, the dynamis power, the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit. We go to the second one, Revelations 11, 15 speaks about it, it says, seek first, oh, sorry, not Revelations, Matthew 6.33, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added. You see, if you seek the things, you miss the king, and oftentimes also the things will elude you. But if you seek the king, then the things come. And in Revelations 11.15, it says, all the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord, and He shall reign forevermore. It speaks of the sovereign power of God. It's the Greek word basilia. Basilia refers to the kingdom of God, or the sovereign rule, the reign of Jesus Christ, the lordship of Jesus Christ. You see, if we prioritize seeking the lordship of Jesus over our life. Jesus, I want you to be Lord in every area of my life. I want you to be Lord in my finances, in my job, in my career, my business. I want you to be Lord in my head, in my mind, my thoughts. If you're married, in my marriage, in my family, in every aspect of your life. Then all these things will be added. Everything will be added. So it says, you know, all the kingdoms of the world will become the kingdoms of our Lord in His Christ. 
In other words, Jesus will reign over all the kingdoms of this world, and we've got various kingdoms. How will that work? You see, Jesus will begin to reign over the kingdoms through us. You and I are ambassadors of heaven's kingdom on earth. So how do we do that? And we're going to get to that later. But Jesus says, I will build my church and I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loosen on earth will be loose in heaven. Okay. Now the transliteration of that verse really means this. Whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loosen on earth would have been loosened in heaven. In other words, I give you the authority to unlock on earth what I've already unlocked in heaven. I give you the authority to, to lock up on earth what I have already locked up in heaven. Come on. And if God says, I, I, I make certain provisions for you to fulfill this purpose or this assignment I have you, and I'm unlocking the provisions of that in heaven through sending you one word that carries my authority, then you and I have a key on earth to unlock the provision for that assignment. Isn't that amazing? And if there's something that is harassing your family, maybe there's a demonic spirit that is harassing one of your children and it's trying, maybe a spirit of rejection or confusion that's come over one of your children, God is giving you the authority to lock up on earth what has been locked up in heaven. Acts 4 verse 33 says, With mega grace and mega power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and mega grace was upon all of them. The Greek word is there, charis, and it refers to enabling power. Grace is an enablement of God. He enables me to do what I cannot do in my own strength. And it says great grace was on the entire church. Grace means, grace means that there's a leaning towards. It means God leans towards someone to share all of his benefits with them. That's what grace means. God leans, and, and in Jesus, God bestowed grace on us. He showed grace. Already. So Jesus came down, and when we couldn't reach out to God, Jesus leaned towards us on the cross. He leaned towards us so that God can lavish all his benefits upon us. Does that make sense? But now God comes, and the gifts that he's given you is also charis. You know that? The spiritual gifts is also part of the, the word charis. And so every time you and I operate in our spiritual gifts like we learned last night and the night before, it is God leaning through us to someone else to share his benefits with him. Isn't that amazing? And the Bible says in the church of Acts, the 3,000, or by that time, there probably 5,000, it says great grace, great grace was upon them. Why was great grace on the church in in Acts, because I believe every one of those 3,000 people or every one of those 5,000 people operated in their gifts. You see, all of them operated, and so through all of them, God could lean into people. He could lean towards people and reach out to them and bestow His benefits upon, upon them. You see, it's unlike today's church where only 20% of us know what our gifts are. Can you imagine 3,000 people operating in their gifts? How, how God can lean into a city if we do that. How God can lean into a country if we've got 3,000 people knowing what their gifts are, allowing God to lean through them to others. Wow, that's amazing. That's enabling power. Then Philippians 2. Now you're on that slide that we had up earlier. Philippians 2 verse 12. For it is God who works. And the word work there is the, is the Greek word energeo. It's God who works in us to will and to do, and the word do is again in a J-O, according to his good pleasure. God works in us to will first, and then he works in us to do according to his good pleasure. We know the scripture in Hebrews 4 that says the word of God is powerful. But the word powerful there in a J-O, means the word of God holds operative power, power to operate. It is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. The next dimension of power is operative power. Just turn to someone you love and say, God is giving you power to operate. Operative power in a jail, in the, in the Greek language, means that God gives me both the ability to will His will and then to do His will. It is God that works in us to first will His will. Because I can't do His will until I've willed His will. Come on. 
And so when the Word of God comes, the Word of God is powerful. The Word of God carries energy. The Word of God carries operative power. And that one word that God speaks to you will release in you. If you embrace the Word of God, if you embrace His Word, that one word will release in you the power to will God's will and then the power to do God's will. I remember when God called me into the mission field, I had prophecies saying that I will walk the streets of Asia and all sorts of places and minister to uh, Chinese people and all sorts of people around the, the Southeast Asian continent. And at that time, I had that massive knee injury where I couldn't stand for longer than five minutes without experiencing excruciating pain. And so I said to the Lord, I said, listen, God, I will go if you heal my knees. And he said to me, but will you go if I don't? <laughs> and I said, yes, I will go. I will go. And we went. And for two years, we did about 75 flights, traveled all across Southeast Asia and the Pacific, carried boxes of books and guitars and everything, and, and did mission work wherever we went. And you know what? God sustained me. There were nights where, where, I, where I almost cried because of pain after a day on the street. But God sustained me. And when I got back, He healed me. You see, God's word and His challenge to me released the power to will His will and then the power to do His will. It's God work that works in us both to will and to do His will. You know that scripture that we all love? Romans 8 verse 28. It's one of our favorite scriptures. Now we know that God makes all things work together for the good, for those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. It's a wonderful scripture. so encouraging when we're going through difficult times. But the context of that scripture, God works all things together. The word work is again energia. You see, God's going to work all things together when I allow the energy of power to, to penetrate my heart. When I, when I say, Lord, I, you, you see, He works all things together for those who are called according to His purpose, for those who will His will, for those who say, yes, Lord, I will go even if you don't heal my knees. I, I want to will your will, and then I'm going to do your will. And then God works everything together for the good. It's a powerful scripture because it, it, it says that God works all things. God releases the energy, the energy. To work all things in synergy is the Greek word. God works, he, he releases the energy to work all things in synergy so that you and I can fulfill our destiny. You get that? And they're really super excited. And Jesus gave them authority which is the Greek word exousios, to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall in the, in injure you, he said to them. That is authoritative power. The word exousios, authoritative power. It means the power to act or the power of eternity, of eternity to act on behalf of someone else. Now what's the difference between power and authority? Who can help me? Power and authority. Does the devil, devil have authority? Very little authority. Does he have power? Yes. Jesus says, he says, I give you, I give you authority, exousios, over the power, which is dunamis. So the devil has dunamis. He's got some dynamic power in him. He's not powerless, but he doesn't have authority unless we give him authority. Okay? So, so the best way to describe it, if, if you get a truck driver that drives a 10-ton truck. How many of you know that the truck driver holds some, uh, holds some power behind the steering wheel? He's got the power, right? And then next to the road, somebody with a nice hat and a white glove jumps out. It's called the traffic officer. And that white glove and the badge that he carries doesn't give him power, but it gives him authority. And so although the truck driver has the authority or the power to pass this guy by. How many of you know that if he does this, he will unleash the full power and the force of the South African government and the South African army? Which might not be much at this point. <laughs> but the legal system of South Africa, 
So, so the traffic officer has authority, but the truck driver has power. Satan has power, but you and I are given authority over all of his power. You'll stand on scorpions and serpents. It speaks of demonic influences, and nothing will harm you. See, the devil can only have authority if you and I give it to him. Doesn't that? He's got power. So if we give him authority over our lives by, by, by becoming into bondage of, to a certain sin or or yielding to the temptations of the flesh, we, we give him authority and then he can use his power to oppress us. What did Eve do? Adam and Eve was mandated in the Garden of Eden to rule and reign. God said, govern the earth. But Eve took her authority and by submitting to the serpent and to the advice and the words of the serpent, and when she subjected herself to the lies of the serpent, she gave him authority over her life. And he messed up the Garden of Eden. He messed up the authority. In Luke 1, verse 35, it says, The Holy Spirit was hovering over the waters to create light into darkness, form into chaos, and substance into the void. It's my translation of Genesis 1. The Holy Spirit was hovering over the face of the deep, and then God's word came. And in Luke 1 verse 35, Mary, the mother of Jesus, she was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit's power from on high. We're talking about the overshadowing power of the Holy Spirit. Both the Old Testament and the New Testament starts with the Holy Spirit overshadowing so that the Word of God can create. And something profound happens when we allow the Holy Spirit to overshadow us. And I think that's kind of what happened this week for many of us. Just sitting here under the presence. I was just speaking to someone before the time and he said, I asked him what stood out for you. He said, just being under the presence of the Holy Spirit. Just sitting under the presence. See, when that happens, the Holy Spirit hovers over us. He overshadows us. And that one word comes and it creates light. And for Mary, that one word impregnated her. Think about it. God spoke a word through the angel. He said, you will be with child and that child will be the savior of the world and you shall call him jesus emmanuel god with us and what was the response how how should we respond when the holy spirit overshadowed us and the word of god comes to us you know what she said be done to me according to your word there's this heat seeking missile of a word of god that he spoke to her the double word the preceding word of god loaded with every resource needed to bring that word into fulfillment. And all Mary did was, she said, be done to me according to your word. The other word to say that is amen. That's really what amen means. Amen means be it so. And so Mary really, really said amen to the word of God as the Holy Spirit overshadowed it. And the moment she said amen to God's word, you know what happened? That word became a seed on the inside of her. And that seed became Jesus Christ in her womb. And I found that that when God speaks that word to me, and I respond appropriately when I respond with an amen, with the right kind of amen. When I respond with the words in the heart to say, be done to me according to your word. I don't know how you're going to do it. I can't see myself doing it, God. But if you said it, I believe it. And that settles it. When I respond with an amen, something profound happens. That word impregnates me with something of Jesus Christ that I'm called to birth into this world. Come on. Luke 10 verse 10. Jesus, remember now he sent them out to represent the kingdom and they returned and with great joy it says Lord even the demons submit to us how many of you would be excited that the demons submit to you Woo-hoo. okay and Jesus replied I saw Satan fell like lightning from heaven I like that verse I like the song as well okay and I've given you authority or exousios to overcome all the power of the enemy nothing will harm you however he says do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And the Greek word we want to look at there is names, which is onoma. The, the Greek word means reputation or reputation power. We have the saying, you're going to make your name mark in Afrikaans. You're going to make your name, you're going to make your name mark, or you, your reputation, right? You see, because a person's name represents his reputation. And Jesus says to them, don't, Rejoice about the fact that demons submit to you. Rather rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And the transliteration of that verse is rather rejoice that your names 
are written together with my name in heaven. Rejoice in the fact that your names are intertwined. The word there is like a cook sister. You know what a cook sister is? Your names are intertwined with my name in heaven. It's mixed with my name and established with my name in the same place that my name is written in heaven. Your names are written. Rejoice in the fact that you have the same stature and authority and reputation in the spiritual realm than what I have. Because your reputation gives you a spiritual stature and authority. Does it make sense? Now why is this important? When, when we want to operate in power, when we want to live the kingdom life, it's very important that we have a reputation. Jesus says your reputation in the spirit is more important than your position. It's even more important than your anointing, your reputation. There was these guys in the book of Acts, and you can go and read it. They were called the sons of Sceva. Have you ever heard of the sons of Sceva? Okay. So these chaps were Jewish exorcists. They drove out demons. They were called ghostbusters. Okay? They were the ghostbusters of the, of the Jewish sect, the Pharisees. And so they saw that Paul, the apostle, did extraordinary miracles in the name of Jesus. And so what these guys did, they were trying to drive out a demon out of a demoniac. And they said, go out demon in the name of Jesus Christ whom Paul preaches. And you know, the demon started speaking back to him. On a lighter note, I don't know if ever, any one of you have heard a demon spoke, but, speak, but, but you, you know, they sometimes do speak when you drive out demons. So there's this joke about the guys doing deliverance and the, and the person battles with the spirit of, what is if you eat too much? Gluttony. So he says, spirit of gluttony come out in the, in the name of Jesus. And, this, and the demonic spirit talked back. And he said, I'll come out, but for, only for a cookie. But these guys said, come, these guys said, come out in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. So here's what the spirit says, that the demonic spirit talks back. He's, this is what he says. He says, he says, Jesus we know, which in the, in the Greek language means Jesus we have, we have been acquainted with since the beginning of time. We know who Jesus is. And then the, the demonic spirit says, and Paul we have learned is from the same league. In other words, Paul operates in the same reputation as Jesus. But who the heck are you? And then this demon-possessed man attacked these sons of Sceva, and they left there wounded and naked. Okay? How many Christians do that? They do exactly that. They hear teaching from this guy or teaching here, and they, they try to be spiritual ninjas and take on the devil and take on all sorts of spirits. But they've never built reputation in the spiritual realm. And so they get a big hiding because the devil goes like, Jesus I know and Kenneth Copeland I know, whoever else. But who the heck are you? And I'm going to have a part of the deal, you see. You see, we have to develop our reputation in the spirit. Two ways to develop our reputation. The easiest way I'll have to do is just to pray in the name of Jesus. Come on. He says, whatever you ask the Father in my name, you're going to get anyway. Ask in my reputation. It's not about your name. It's not about your... But, but just submit yourself to my reputation. And then the other way in which we can build our reputation is by dying to self. By realizing it's not about me. By coming to the end of myself. Coming to the end of my image so that I can represent his image. Coming to the end of my will, what I want and my priorities so that I can represent his priorities and his will. When I died to myself, that's when in Philippians 2, it says Jesus was given a name, a onoma, a reputation that is above every other reputation in the heavens and the earth. Why? Because he was willing to die to himself. Ephesians 6 verse 10 says, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. There's three words there. Be strong in the Lord and in the kratos, the Greek word, power of his might is ishes. We talk about the resurrection power, the issues, the might of God, okay? It's a forcefulness in our character. And, 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 and the word issues means resurrection power. It means to rise again. The righteous will fall seven times, but he will rise every time. When you and I go through difficult times, when you and I go through challenging situations, and we find a way in the Lord to rise again, we are activating the issues power, the resurrection power of Jesus. 
And that's why we as Christians have to go through difficult things. That's how we have to go through tough times because it develops our ability to operate in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? I remember when we bought our first house, we were like 3,000 grand short on our monthly budget. I was so stressed out as a young pastor in the ministry, I developed shingles, you know, about over 3,000 rand a month. Okay. And then subsequently we bought other properties and things that are way beyond that and the shortfall was way beyond that and I didn't develop shingles. The reason why is I had to learn to rise from that persecution, rise from that trouble rise from the difficulty in the resurrection power so that I can prevail over circumstances my capacity to rule and reign with Jesus increased in the area of finances that makes sense that's why you go through difficult times but you have to become a victor in you have to overcome in that area when you overcome then that issues power is established in your life and it gives you the ability to rise now whatever you rise from you will rule in Ephesians 6, it says, Be strong again in the Lord and in the gratis power of His might. We've just covered that scripture. And then Jesus says in John 4, 34, My food is to finish the will who sent me, of, of Him who sent me. And we talk about finishing power. The, the power to finish things. The word kratos in the Greek is the power to finish or complete something. And it also means to establish the dominion or the lordship. You see, I don't establish the lordship of Jesus over something unless I finish it. Think, think with me. Jesus had to finish his work on the cross to establish the dominion of God over the, over the nations. Does it make sense? The most powerful words that were ever spoken in the history of mankind was, it is finished. And the moment he finished the work, the, the kingdom of God was established. Now that's something that probably our younger generation lacked because we we were never exposed to military service because when when we when men was still exposed to military service they they learned something about phosphate they learned something about perseverance they they learned something about finishing power and finishing strong and finishing together but but I, I'm afraid that my generation and the generation younger than myself, we don't have that sticking power. We don't have that prevailing power, that, that power to finish and, and pull things through right to the end. Because if we don't endure to the end, we don't overcome. If we don't endure to the end, the kingdom of God is not established. Come on, Jesus says, my food, my satisfaction is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish it. Because the kingdom doesn't come until we finish. You know, today's generation get, get the participation medals. You know what I'm talking about. They get a medal just for running. They come last. They didn't even finish the race, but just the fact that they arrived, they get a medal. You see, we, we're building a weak generation. We're building a weak mindset. It's not just good enough to, to arrive. You have to finish. Paul says, I have finished my race. I have stayed the course and I have finished the race. And there's something that God is building into our hearts in this time. And it doesn't matter what generation we're from. He's saying, I want to build into you the power to finish. I want to build the kratos. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might, in the power to finish, in the power to complete, in the power to stay the course until, like Paul, you can say, I've finished the race. I've done my part. I've completed it. Otherwise, the kingdom doesn't come. Wow. And then in Isaiah 40, verse 31, our beloved scripture on which this church was founded and built, it says, those who wait or hope in the Lord will renew their strength. And the word strength there is the word creative power. Isn't that amazing? Where's all the creative people here? And they will mount up on wings like eagles and shall run and not become weary and they shall walk and not faint. And the final dimension of God's power is creative power. Do you know that there's a creative solution for every problem that we may face? Any problem has a creative solution. God has given us the ability to tap into heaven's creativity to, to solve any conceivable problem. The word kuach there is creative power. It's vital to our victory. You see, the magicians in Egypt could do some of the tricks. They could copy some of the tricks that Moses did. They also threw down their, their canes and it became serpents. And then Moses' serpent ate their 
snakes, right? They could also perform some of the tricks, but the moment Moses began to do creative miracles, they could not follow. Why? Because the devil is only a copycat. There's no creativity in the devil. You see, Jesus did creative miracles. There was a, once a blind man who was blind since birth, meaning he never had properly functioning eyeballs. And so Jesus came, he spit on the, on the clay, and he took some of the clay and the mud, and he began to form clay, and he's, he smeared the clay on top of his eye. I think what Jesus did, he was forming new eyeballs for this man. He was doing a creative miracle. There was no eyeballs before, come on. Jesus says, I only do what I see and saw my father do. You see, back in, back in Genesis, when God was forming Adam from the clay, he was fashioning Adam. Jesus took a close look and he saw his dad forming eyeballs and putting it into Adam while it was still a clay body. And so Jesus knew he had to do a creative miracle. So he took some clay and he was forming new eyeballs for the blind man. He was operating in the creative power of God. God calls a young man called Gideon and he says, go in, in this your might. You're going to deliver Israel from the Midianite depression. Go in this your might. And the word again there is creative power. Go in your creative power. Because every problem has got a creative solution. You might be at work. You might be in business. Maybe in your finances. I promise you every time that Katinka and I ran into financial, the hardship of difficulty, there was a creative solution to meet the need, to answer the problem. Every time. Be it making a flat, be it do this, do that. There's always a creative solution. I remember when we wanted to get married and I, I was earning, I can't say what I was earning. I think I was earning 800 grand a month and we wanted to get married. Maybe 1,200 grand a month. I remember that once we, after we got married to, together, we earned 2,000 rand after tax, tax 1,800 rand after rent, we had 400 rand left. And out of that, I paid a cell phone for 140 rand. That gave us a 260 rand left. Food, fuel, everything else. There was no medical aid or things like that. We, we couldn't get married. And yet God provided through creativity for us to get married. We couldn't even buy furniture for our house. So I went to make the furniture out of steel. My dad helped me and we made some furniture and I bonded with my future father-in-law. You see, oftentimes there's a creative solution to the problem. It's, it's not only just throwing money at a problem. Remember in the mission field, God said to us, don't, don't ask for sponsorship. I will provide. And I said, Lord, how are you going to provide? And then a year later, he said to me, write a book. And that book financed our entire mission. There's always a creative solution for the problems we're facing. In, in Scripture, where it says in Deuteronomy, I will give you the power to create wealth. It's, it's a kuach power. It's a, there's a creative power to create wealth. And God is saying, I'm giving you that, that power. Wow. Well, it says, those who wait on the Lord. If you're at the end of your strength, if you're at the end of your answers, if you're at the end of your solutions, God is saying, wait on me. Hope in me. Trust in me. And I will renew your kuach. I will renew your creativity. I will renew your creative power to, to give you solutions. Thanks for watching this Holy Spirit series. Remember to order your copy of You Shall Receive Power at info at cohcc.net. Thanks for sharing this series so more people can be empowered.